Today's episode has been brought to you by Schedulicity. Welcome to episode 101 of the Connected Yoga Teacher Podcast and to the very first episode in our Yoga Studio Business 101 mini-series. I've created this series for you because you listeners and Facebook group members have asked some amazing questions. So in the next five weeks, we're going to talk about the business of owning and managing a yoga studio, why a mission statement and setting core values is so important, how to hire, grow, and nurture a team that will support you and your yoga business. And then to wrap everything up, we're going to talk about some really cool questions that I have seen or heard about the legal side of owning a yoga business and the insurance side. Those maybe don't sound like really big, exciting things, but for me, it is because a lot of you have been asking questions in both of those fields. And what wasn't easy for me as the podcast host was to find someone to interview who really knew about the yoga business in terms of insurance and legal questions. So I'm so excited to bring that to you. Are you in our Facebook group for yoga teachers? If you are currently in a yoga teacher training now, or if you are a certified yoga teacher, you are invited to join us there. The goal of that group is to support you in your yoga journey. There are no dumb or bad questions and everyone who's sharing yoga in some way is invited to join. As I shared in episode 100 with Linda Sparrow last week, this was a huge motivation for me in creating the podcast and the Facebook group. I want yoga teachers to feel supported, a safe space for questions and for learning. So that's what our Facebook group is, and it would be so fun to see you there. Okay, so this yoga studio business mini series is for those of you who either are or who dream of becoming a yoga studio owner, but it's also for the independent yoga teacher who wants to build a yoga business. If you are a yoga teacher who isn't trying to grow your business in any way, or if you never want to own, manage, or work at a yoga studio, this mini series might not be for you. But if you've ever had any legal, insurance, or business questions, there is going to be a pile of information here. Today, I'm kicking things off by telling you what I've learned as a yoga studio manager. And then in the next four episodes, you're going to hear from different experts in different fields. And I know I've learned a lot. And just a reminder, and this is for me as well as you, start with just one thing. If you hear a pile of things in this mini series and you feel like, I want to do it all, I get it. I feel like that sometimes. And I know in my own life, what has really helped and what really moves the needle is when I take on one thing at a time and I either complete that one thing or I make it so that it's part of my routine in my life or in my business. And then I add something else. I realize it might not seem like it's fast enough, but trust me. It's very effective. Another reminder here is that you are going to hear perspectives and opinions. Take what works for you. Maybe you modify it. We're each unique and we work in unique ways. So if you do modify something or if you have another idea, let us know. Go to the show notes at theconnectedyogateacher.com slash 101 And let us know your ideas, your thoughts, your comments on this episode or the entire mini series. Before we get right into today's topic, I want to say hello and thank you to a couple of listeners and to our sponsor. Roseanne, thank you for your Facebook review. Roseanne says, so informative and helpful. I think it's fun that your review came right at the time of the studio episode because we met at one of the yoga studios in my area. So I think that's really cool. Also a shout out of thanks to Mindful Med from the United States who says, I just started listening to these podcasts and joined the Connected Yoga Teacher group. As a yoga teacher and an aspiring physician working in integrative medicine and research, I especially love hearing about yoga for certain conditions and new research. I can't wait to keep listening more. Thank you so much to both of you for taking the time to leave a review. I know that there are a few steps involved and it really means a lot. 
And if you're thinking about leaving a review, go ahead, do it. And maybe you'll hear me read it out on the podcast. I try and read every single one. Also, a shout out of thanks to our sponsor, Schedulicity. Yes, they make the podcast possible each and every week. But did you know that I found Schedulicity because I became the manager for a yoga studio and I was looking for a software. And at that time, Schedulicity wasn't free. We paid $11 a month for the service and it was the best one out there. And it wasn't even created for yoga studios. It's just that the software worked so well and our yoga students could sign up for classes and one-on-one sessions with us and we made it fit. Now, fast forward, I've talked about Schedulicity over the years. They're now our podcast sponsor and more and more they're serving yoga studios and individual yoga teachers. So let's hear our hot tip of the week from Schedulicity. Hey, Connected Yoga Teachers, this is Scotty with the Schedulicity Hot Tip of the Week. Class client alerts can help make sure nothing goes overlooked, whether it's unresolved billing, unsigned waivers, or other missing information that can easily be forgotten in the hustle and bustle of a busy class. If you have multiple yoga teachers working at your studio, this is a perfect way to make sure everyone is up to date and on the same page. Your online client files will stay more organized than any filing cabinet, giving you a greater peace of mind and more control over your time and space. Thank you so much for that, Scotty. I love how I can add notes about a yoga student or teacher that I'm working with and that just me and my team can see those notes. It really helps me to stay organized. If you're new here, my name is Shannon Crow. I'm a mother of three, a yoga teacher, and a trainer and consultant working for yoga teachers. This podcast was created for you so that you can connect to information and ideas and inspiration every single week and feel supported as you navigate the jungles of yoga entrepreneurship. Today, I want to share as much as I possibly can about what I have learned by working at and managing four yoga studios since I became a yoga teacher in 2006. I've seen different business models and learned along the way. And I have to say, I don't think I always learn the easy way. (laughs) I've worn many hats at this various yoga studios. Tone Yoga Studio in Owen Sound is where I learned the most because I worked there the longest and because Catherine, the owner of the studio, hired me to run the studio like it was my own. And I did that for over five years. I trained other management staff to take over when I started to do more and more consultation work and this podcast started to take off. And now I rent space at Tone Studio and I teach there still. I love that space. I feel so connected to it and the teachers that work there. I know the work that has gone into making it a yoga studio. It is such a beautiful space. And Catherine, the owner, cares so much about the yoga community and how we are there to serve the larger community. Overall, Tone Studio is an inclusive and inviting space because of the foundation that Catherine and our team set. When Catherine first approached me to teach at Tone, I was really honest with her and I told her that the studio needed a website, a calendar, and a roster of teachers first. I said, I think the studio needs a manager. She then hired me to make that happen. So I found out with that position what it was like to start from a beautiful restored church building and turn that into a yoga studio. Today, I want to summarize and share six things that I learned along the way as a yoga studio manager. Today, I'm going to talk about setting prices with confidence, registered sessions versus drop-in, regular, consistent communication and why that is so important, attention to numbers and data, community over competition, and lastly, that teachers are the brand. Let's start with setting your prices with confidence because that really is one of the most popular questions that I get and that I work with when I work with yoga teachers. When I was yoga studio manager, yoga teachers would contact our studio request to teach with us, and then often ask us what they should be charging for their classes. And this was before we had set some pretty strict guidelines on what classes would be. 
we were learning at the same time. There was some uncomfortable spots, but I want to share with you what I learned along the way. Looking back now, I think we went about this a little bit backwards. And when I say we, I really mean me, because remember, I was making the decisions as studio manager and we were starting from zero. I set to researching average class prices for yoga as well as other movement modalities or other group classes where there was a teacher and a group of students of some kind. And this is what was used to set our prices in the beginning. If I was going to do it all over again, I would take more into account the yoga teacher first. And the reason why is because everything hinges on that teacher. The teacher needs to make enough money so that they can continue to sustain those yoga classes. Just to clarify, I think it's the responsibility of the studio to come up with a fair payment to yoga teachers so that you maintain this amazing yoga teacher team. A little bit further on in this episode, I'm going to go into more of why the yoga teachers are the brand. But at this point right now, when we're talking about pricing and sustainability, the sustainability of a yoga business really hinges on if we can maintain those professional relationships and maintain our hires of yoga teachers. Also in episode 103 coming up, Shelly Warren is going to talk more about hiring, growing, and nurturing a team. So if you feel like that's the information you need right now, if you're a studio owner and you're hiring teachers, make sure to have a listen to that episode. For right now, I want to talk about individual teachers setting their prices with confidence and what this looks like and doesn't look like. For example, I was working with one teacher who was sharing a movement-based class and she came to me when she saw that her class sizes were lower than what she wanted. And her idea was that she wanted to lower her class price to be, instead of $10 per hour, lower it down to be $5 per hour. I advised her against it, and I told her all of my arguments for that, saying, you know, ultimately it was up to her, that's the way our studio ran at the time, but that I knew from experience that yoga students kind of felt like they were getting what they paid for. But this teacher really insisted. So over the next few weeks, her class sizes actually decreased more. And eventually she discontinued that class. It petered out completely. And I get the mindset behind this. If you think, well, I want to clear $30 in this class and I can fit 10 people in. So technically they only have to pay $3 each. What does a $3 yoga class feel like to you compared to a $12, a $15, a $20, a $30 yoga class? There's science behind where people in different situations, uh, one example is people were given the same kind of wine in two different bottles, told that one kind of wine was this price and one kind of wine was this way higher price. And people were saying that the higher price wine tasted better when it was exactly the same wine. We as consumers tend to believe the saying, you get what you pay for. Also, think for a moment about how your dentist or your auto mechanic or your physiotherapist deals with you around billing, pricing, and payments. How would it feel if all of a sudden your dentist told you that there's a two-for-one deal (laughs) or that the first visit was free or that they had decreased their price because they were trying to get more clients or you just see that they decreased their price? We have a lot of money mindset stuff going on already in our brains, and we need to look at that from our consumer's perspective as well, that lowering the price and having a good deal isn't always what gives us value and isn't always what makes us look like a professional. Think of the kinds of professions that lower their prices, make deals with you. Right away, I'm thinking of a car salesperson. So here's where you get to decide. Where do you want to be on this? When you set your prices, are you telling people your prices with confidence? Are you submitting your invoices to people and expecting payment? Do you have payment policies clearly laid out? Or do you kind of get quiet and hover and make your body smaller when people are going to pay you? Another note is to write down the money you have invested in the trainings you've taken. This is such a great exercise. Consider not only the tuition, but also the travel, your stay, 
your study materials, so those books or music files, the time spent away from your daily routine or work, what that has cost you, list it all out. Sometimes this can allow us to see that we've really invested in our training and in the time to get to where we are now. And then we feel more justified or more confident in setting our prices. If you're still getting stuck on money mindset, we have two episodes on pricing and money mindset, and those are really worth going back to and listening to. Episode 11 with Tracy Eccleston is on setting prices and defining your value as a yoga teacher. And episode 42 is Money Mindset with Geraldine Carter, where she really digs into some of our money story. This past year, I was working with a yoga teacher who really wanted to define their niche, and I was doing the niche work with them. And part of that is defining an ideal yoga student, and this person defined the ideal yoga student as earning around $20,000 Canadian. And for here, $20,000 Canadian doesn't mean that you have extra money to spend. And so I questioned this person a little bit, and they said, I want to make yoga accessible even to people who can't afford it. And so I said, what would it feel like to set that annual income for your yoga students higher so that you can then in turn give to the people who have a lower income in one way or another? So have a look at your money mindset. Are you setting it because you're trying to serve and give? Are you setting it because of the stories you heard as a child? What is holding you back with your prices and your confidence around setting prices? Are you raising your rates yearly? So we know that the price of fuel and living and everything goes up every year. Minimum wage goes up. People get regular raises when they're employed and they're working as employees. So you also, as a self-employed entrepreneur, yoga teacher, deserve a raise. Another way to build some confidence around your prices is to create a list of how you have helped people with the yoga offerings that you share. And if you're brand new to this, think of your own yoga story. How did your teachers impact your life? And did you feel like they were charging you too much for classes? Yoga teachers are offering a lot to yoga students. A lot of tools, techniques, community, All kinds of amazing things to help people to cope and I think really to be more themselves, to be more connected to self, to feel more at home in their body, in their thoughts. So often I hear from yoga students that yoga has been life-changing for them and the offerings, you can't even put a price on it. It's impacted their life that much. And we as yoga teachers need to allow our yoga students to pay us for that. They're not paying for yoga. They're paying for us to drive there, to set up, to have bolsters, to have email, to have our lights on, all of the other things. The yoga part of it can be free, but we need to pay to bring it to people. A really simple way to set your prices is to calculate your hourly wage and aim to make that for both your one-on-one sessions, if you teach one-on-one sessions, and your group classes. And the way to calculate that really easily is to look around in your area and see what are physiotherapists making for an hour? What's a massage therapist making for an hour? What are other yoga teachers charging for that hour? We don't go solely on that information because we might have specialized training. We might have something else. We might have a longer drive. But basically, what do we need to make in an hour? One of the yoga studios that I worked at reached out to me and asked me if I would work there. And I told them what my hourly wage was per class. And they let me know that that was higher than what they were paying any of their teachers. And I stuck to my hourly wage and said, like basically, I was saying to them, okay, well, thank you so much for reaching out to me. They got back in touch with me and said, we will hire you at your hourly wage. Please don't tell any of the other teachers. So I knew what my time was worth. I stuck to that. I told them with confidence and they turned around and agreed to pay me that. Now, I don't agree with the whole, please don't tell other yoga teachers. I wasn't planning on going and telling other yoga teachers, but I do also want to add that that yoga studio didn't stay in business very long. I think that it was kind of the foundation 
was crumbling from the beginning with things like that. A couple final notes on this. It still is a little bit like the Wild West here in the yoga world. So I think it isn't always viewed, or we as yoga teachers aren't always viewed as professionals with a real career, (laughs) even by ourselves. And I really believe that it does begin with us as yoga professionals. So watch the next time you go to introduce yourself to someone. Oh, I'm just a yoga teacher. Catch yourself if you're saying that. We get to set the bar. We get to set our prices, just like plumbers, electricians, self-employed carpenters, auto mechanics. You get to set the bar. Are you a professional and where are your prices? I don't know if you can tell, but I get super passionate about this topic. (laughs) And when the yoga teacher down the road from you starts offering free yoga classes and yours are over $100 an hour, please know that you are not in competition with that person. That teacher is not going to steal your ideal yoga students. Your ideal yoga students know your value. Sure, some students might go to that class or they might try it out, but you are really setting yourself apart. Free yoga is going to feel very different than $100 an hour plus yoga. And know that your classes, your offerings are worth it. And if you're doubting that, is there something you can add to your offerings to make it worth it? So if you know that you need to charge $90 per hour for a class to grow a sustainable yoga business so you can pay your bills and make a bit of profit, Ask yourself, how can I offer a class that is worth $90 per hour? Number two in this list, and these are in no particular order, is registered sessions. Really consider doing registered sessions instead of drop-in classes. And before you tell me why you need to do drop-in classes or your studio needs to host drop-in classes, just hear me out for a moment. Over the years, I've noticed that students really have a commitment when they sign up and they pay. We have this for other things. If we sign up and pay for swim lessons or guitar lessons, we are signing up. And especially if we're taking this as a group, we're not holding back the rest of the group. We pay in advance and we go when we can. And when we miss, it's our own loss. For a yoga studio or a yoga teacher, this means that we know roughly what our income will be in a certain month or in that session. So for me, I know that I usually get between 12 and 18 registered students for my registered sessions, and my registered sessions run from usually 11 weeks, sometimes 10 weeks. And I can really count on and depend on my income for those 10 or 11 weeks. In a yoga studio, or if you're a teacher who's renting space, this means that if a session doesn't fill, if there isn't enough interest, or if you haven't marketed it where people know about it so that they can sign up for it, that's a whole other podcast, then you have the ability to book the space out for something else. Also, if you are uncomfortable taking payment from students, guess what? With a registered session, You only have to do that at the very beginning. And then people are just showing up. They've already paid. They've committed. They've told you that they value this. And it is just your job to show up and offer the yoga. All this said, I don't think that registered sessions are always the answer. But if you are a yoga studio that is struggling to fill classes, or if you're a yoga teacher who's struggling to get students into your classes, try it. Give it a try and see how it works. Offer it as a bonus. Maybe you're doing a registered session that is really specific to runners, yoga for runners, where all of your other classes are more generalized. That way you can try it out, see if it works, try the niche on, and then make a decision after that. Number three, regular consistent communication matters. So this matters to our yoga students Just in the past two months, so remember how I said I used to manage Tone Studio, I don't anymore, but I did manage that for five years. In the past two months, different yoga students have come to me and said, I really miss knowing what's going on at the studio. I don't have regular and consistent newsletters like we used to. 
And this really matters to students. They feel sort of left out of the loop. Now I will get into more of how things changed at Tone because it is still a studio running. You might be like, what, is there no newsletter anymore? Kind of, yes and no. Before I tell that story though, I want to ask you, do you have a regular and consistent way of communicating with your yoga students? Maybe you post on social media on a regular basis and keep them informed. My preference really is email. I feel like we own the platform sort of. We can always count on being able to send students email. We can't always count on social media that it will one, be there or two, work the way it always has. Lately, some of you might notice in my emails, I treat it more like an email to a friend. So during the time where I sit down to write an email to you, the listeners, the yoga teachers out there, I kind of reflect back on how has the week been? Is there anything that I really want to share in real time that I didn't talk about on the podcast or I'm not posting about on social that gets a little more into what's going on in my life? And I get a lot of feedback from my yoga students as well about my newsletter because I do the same thing. If my family goes on vacation, I might include some stories or an image of our family doing something on our vacation. So my yoga students, and I'm cautious to say my, (laughs) the yoga students who I teach, they feel more connected to me, to my life and to my personal stories. That's my take on what is effective communication. And believe me, when I was yoga studio manager, I used to sit there almost banging my head against the wall wondering, what am I going to write in the newsletter today? One of our most popular newsletters for the studio was one time we had this record snowfall. And so I went through and looked at over the years when the record snowfall was and how we had broken the record And we put in there some yoga for your back if you've been doing a lot of shoveling. And people just found like it was really in the moment, uh, fun and informative. Number four is attention to the numbers and the data is powerful. So look at the data that you have right now about your yoga business or your yoga studio. Generally, we think of this in terms of accounting numbers. What money is going out? What expenses do we have? And what money is coming in? What's our income? But also look at your attendance, the schedules. We used to keep a record of how many people attended each and every month of every single year. And it was pretty amazing to see, you know, January, there was this big spike in numbers. Also in September, that's where we really saw people coming back to class. And then there were dips in certain months or a certain workshop really made the numbers jump up higher. Another thing that we saw in the numbers is that people were coming to just one class and then not returning. And at the time we were offering first class free. So we stopped doing that and we stopped seeing this one student showing up for free, us paying our teachers for that student, and then them not coming back again. I know one studio that offered the second class for free. So people were coming, committing, paying for the first class, and then they would get a card to come for the second class. And before you go and make some free class passes, (laughs) really consider what would it be like to give these out? So it might be that you decide to do it as a referral program, but come back to what would I feel like if I went to my hairdresser and they said, you'll pay for this haircut, but you won't pay for the next one. How would you feel? Instead of doing that, maybe they say to you, thanks so much for coming in to get your hair cut today. Here's a referral card. And the way this works is when a friend of yours comes in, brings this card in with your name on it, then you will get a discount and so will your friend. So try it on and see how that might work for you. And this all came from us looking at the numbers. Something else we caught at the yoga studio at one point was this money loss issue. So we, we knew that we were losing money and we were looking at different ways that we were losing money. I'm going to tell you how we switched that all around basically overnight, but we were losing it in our monthly and our six month and our yearly packages. So what we had done is we had increased the number of classes that we were offering, but we didn't adjust our monthly price. <laughs> so we were paying our teachers and our students were paying us less. I actually talk about this next week on the podcast with Steve Hart 
and get his thoughts on this as well. So to summarize number four, it's really attention to the data, to the numbers that you have available for you, or are you avoiding looking at the numbers? I know I've done that in my own business, in my own personal life with my accounting, and I know that I always need to come back to what am I avoiding here and why am I avoiding this? I actually talk about this in a podcast episode, which was a coaching call for me with Amber De La Garza. So I'll make sure to link to that in the show notes of how I've evolved at looking at my accounting and my numbers in my own business and how I can work to do more. Amber helps me to do that. And I think we can always take a look at this. Number five is community over competition. I worked at a yoga studio that had a policy where yoga teachers were only allowed to work at our yoga studio and not anywhere else. When you really take a look at why that would become a policy or a rule, I think it all comes back to fear of competition, fear that yoga students are going to go somewhere else. I've also seen yoga studios who have a really amazing yoga teacher who's busy with a lot of yoga students, feel threatened by that teacher. If students are really signing up for that teacher and that class, some of the other teachers start to feel threatened. That competitiveness starts to come in. Shelley talks to us in episode 103 about how we can instill a positive competition within our team. Personally, I think this is something, this is a human emotion that we are all going to experience at some point, that we are going to have a fear of competition, our competition or who we view as our competition. We will feel competitiveness come up at some point. We will feel jealous or like someone else has more than we have, or why can't I have a business like they have? I think this is one of those emotions that comes up and it's a wave and it's just going to come up unexpected, maybe like joy or a sadness. And so look at what's happening around that time. So often this happens to me when I'm scrolling through social media. So what do I do? I unfollow any accounts that make me feel like this. And it's not the account that's making me, that already sounds victim role here, It's in me. I feel that way looking at that account. If there is a yoga teacher in your area and every time you go to their Instagram account, you see another offering that they're sharing and it makes you feel less than, stop following their account. Instead, eyes on your own page. See what lights you up. See what brings out the best in you. Maybe you want to work on a collaboration with this person, or maybe for a while, you just don't want to follow what they're doing. The same goes for me. If you are following my stuff on social media and you think, oh my gosh, every time I see what Shannon is doing or offering, I feel less than, please unfollow me. Another little tip on this, when you get busy, eyes down, eyes on your own page, You don't have time to look around at the competition and worry. You just have to get this next thing done. You've got this content scheduled out. You've got to get your newsletter out. You have to plan that class. You're just busy and your eyes on your own page. That really helps me in those moments. And if you still feel really stuck with this community over competition, go back and have a listened episode 100 with Linda Sparrow. It is soul soothing to me to listen to that woman. Okay, number six is that teachers are the brand. You as a yoga teacher are the brand, not your colors, not your logo, not your website, not your yoga mat or your cool clothes. Well, this starts to get into maybe the clothing that you choose might go along with your brand. I know some people who have brand colors or they like to wear a certain style of clothing. Your personality, though, is really your brand. And students connect to teachers, not the studio, not the class title, not the community that's showing up. They really connect to the teacher. Students show up because they feel that connection. And this is why subs don't always work in a yoga studio. Have you ever gone to a yoga class? It's going to be your favorite teacher. You show up. 
the teacher shows up and it's not the teacher you were expecting. Or have you ever been a sub of a yoga class? I know I have been, where I walk in and students are like, I can see that deflated, like, ah, it's not our favorite teacher who we're expecting to see tonight. A great example of this is my partner, Sean, asked his yoga class just recently, would you rather I get a sub when I go on holidays or would you rather I cancel the class? And they said, please cancel the class. No one can offer it like you can. Now, let me just clarify that Sean has been teaching for a very long time and he has a real niche specialized yoga offering that's meditation and yoga. And so no, the average yoga teacher cannot fill in for him and cover that class. Same with me teaching yoga for pelvic health. I really get to know that group of students. I know what we're going to work on each and every week, and I don't get subs for those classes. Just to clarify, I'm not saying don't have a good sub in your back pocket for your yoga classes. That's really one of the best things that you can have if you have a sick day or holidays is to keep your classes going. What I am saying is that your yoga students are going to connect to you. And so if you are a yoga studio owner or you want to be someday, you really have to look at your teachers like the connectors of your yoga studio. They are your ambassadors. They are the brand of your studio and everyone needs to be on board. We're going to get into this a little bit more next week with Steve Hart when we talk about mission statement and core values, but I just want to touch on it here. And I've been alluding to this story of the studio, what made a studio or one of our studios go from no profit to profitable overnight is really connected to this piece where teachers are the brand. At this studio, we had one business model where the studio was running as a regular studio business. We paid our teachers, we paid all of the expenses, we did all of the marketing I feel like that's the most common studio business model. Maybe the one thing that we had going on differently was we really encouraged our teachers to share classes, workshops, trainings outside of our space. And we really encouraged that. And we told them we didn't see that as competition. We saw them building sustainable businesses. So that's maybe the one difference that set us apart. But what we switched overnight is we moved to a rental business and What I did not believe was going to happen, happened. So huge kudos to Maxine, who was the studio manager at the time. I was kind of, I don't know what you call it, like I had been studio manager and then I was overseeing and helping, but mainly just talking to Maxine and to Catherine, the studio owner. But huge kudos to them because they came up with this idea of having a rental space And I thought, this isn't going to work. We're not going to have the same, like our students are going to miss out. But here's what actually happened. Yoga teachers stepped up and advertised their classes. They wrote newsletters to their students. They reached out to them and their class numbers went up. So our teachers started making more because they were paying a flat rental fee. We stopped losing money. We weren't paying for the marketing. All that studio was doing then was making the profit from the rent. I'm sharing this story not to tell you that this is the way a yoga studio should be run because remember where I said some of our students in the last couple of months are saying to me, I miss hearing from the teachers. I miss hearing from the studio. So some of those teachers are dropping off, me included, of that regular consistent communication to students. So they're noticing that and A well-run studio takes care of that. But what I really want to bring home is how could there be a combination of both? Or maybe it's a rental and teachers are in charge of that. Or maybe you encourage teachers to reach out to their students more on their own email. I think sometimes this can tap back into number five where yoga studios think, well, if that teacher starts messaging students outside of our studio newsletter, then they are going to be drawn to other things and they'll be pulled away from our studio. And I think it works in the exact opposite way. Okay, connected yoga teachers. I feel like I've covered a lot. We covered prices and really setting those with confidence, registered sessions versus drop-in classes, having regular consistent communication with your yoga students, 
attention to numbers and the data, community over competition, and how yoga teachers are the brand. Who wants to meet up in person? Did you hear that we are having an in-person yoga connected teacher party gathering in Toronto, Ontario at the same time as the yoga show? You can find out more about that on our website. It's Friday, March the 29th. And Schedulicity is sponsoring this event, which means they are supplying the bubbly and the snacks, and we are all the awesome yoga teachers getting together. There's already a Facebook event. Make sure you ask me for it if you haven't seen it already. It looks like a lot of you are interested and going, and I can't wait to meet up in person with you. Also, I'm offering two trainings this year, prenatal yoga teacher training and yoga for pelvic health. Prenatal is happening both in Bermuda and Meaford, Ontario. Bermuda is not in Ontario. (laughs) It's in St. George, Bermuda. Uh, It'll be nice and warm and sunny there in April of 2019 is when both of those begin. Also, the Yoga for Pelvic Health in-person training is happening in November of 2019. And after this yoga business series, I just want to tell you that I'm going to have some big news for you. I'm taking some weeks to think about it, but stay tuned. And it has to do with the Mama Nurture prenatal yoga teacher training. Thank you to our team, Samantha, Suzanne, and Crunch for making today's episode happen. And thank you, you, dear listener, because like I said, this whole series is thanks to your questions. Okay, connected yoga teachers, it is time for me to sign off, but I want to know before I go... What will you be doing this week to stay connected to yourself, to your yoga practice, and to your community so that you can share the yoga that lights you up? 